It's great to be here. Uh, you know, I've, I've been working with National Veterinary Specialists, reading their CTs and MRIs for probably about, gosh, eight or nine years now. So it's, it's great to be able to come by and see the place and, and be able to talk to you guys, uh, especially about something so complicated like, like thoracic radiology. Let's pick something easy next time, right? Let's, let's do elbows. Um, I'm just kidding. Elbows are like the worst. But anyway, a little bit about myself. I basic I went to Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine and uh, graduated from there and thought I was going to be an equine surgeon. So I decided I was going to do an equine internship, which I did at Marion Dupont Scott Equine Medical Center in Leesburg, Virginia. And I got kicked and like a horse broke my leg and I was like, this sucks. So so I thought maybe I'll be a small animal surgeon instead. So I went and did an internship down in in uh, Maitland, Florida, at affiliated veterinary specialist. And uh, the searchers were always so kind of angry. They threw stuff and seemed kind of uptight. But this guy came in in shorts and a t-shirt and like knew everything about everything and like pointed at stuff. And I still remember his first, uh, first case. He walked in and he looked and saw this cat that had an aggressive bone lesion on his toe. He's like, oh, that's called lung digit syndrome. He's got a pulmonary mass. You should take thoracic radiographs. And we're like, no, you're crazy. It's just a, just a lot of osteomyelitis. Sure enough, took a radiograph and there was a big honking tumor in his thorax. And I was like, I want to be him. So it turned out he was a radiologist named Kip Berry. And, uh, and so I applied and got into Cornell University where I did my residency program. And then from there, I went to, Nash uh, to North Carolina, uh, to basically North Carolina State University to be an assistant professor for four years, and that's kind of how I got affiliated with uh, Nashville. And then from there, uh, basically became the head of radiology at Michigan State University, where I was there for another eight years. And then finally, uh, I've just moved to like last week, which is the reason why I'm so sunburned, to Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, so now I am the chief veterinary medical officer for WVC, or Western Veterinary Conference. Uh, and so we do CE programs, and we actually have a standalone facility to teach postgraduate education. But so that's, that's about me. So I've kind of gone from small animal, large animal, and that's one of the things I really liked about radiology is that you can kind of do any species. I mean, we've ultrasounded anything from, from uh, sea turtles all the way through to, uh, to snow leopards and everything in between. So it's, it's nice being veterinarians because we get to see a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things that it never really trains you for is trying to figure out things that you've never seen before. And that's where thoracic radiology becomes very difficult, right? Because let's face it, most people have three diagnoses when you see a thorax. It's either going to be heart failure, it's going to be pneumonia, or it's going to be cancer. And that's kind of what you got. Well, what I'm going to try to do is get you up to five. We'll try to get you to five differentials, and that kind of helps us out a little bit. Because I'm going to add some non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema stuff in there. And then we're going to talk about, you know, some, some other things about cancer and maybe some location. I do all that through case base. So we're going to have a bunch of cases that we'll go through in the second hour. But what I want to do with the first hour is just kind of talk to you a little bit about how this whole thing works. How, how do we even look at a radiograph? How does, why is it so hard sometimes to see stuff or sometimes it's so easy? And just kind of what goes on inside your head. The first thing I need to talk to you about is just the requirements for a study because you know, no matter where you're coming from, depending on where, which clinic you work at and who's been there, a lot of times people are still using hand tanks. We thought that that would have gone away, but they're like, dude, until they break, I'm not gonna get rid of my hand tank. And you're like, it's a bucket, it'll never break. <laughs> so if you really want to, get a drill, go in one night, just drill a hole, oh my god, it's broken. Um, <laughs> then you can go to the automatic processor, which is probably about 60% of people still have. Uh, I know, we always thought that uh, when we were talking about digital radiography, because it's been around for about 10 years now, we said 10 years ago that in five years everybody would have a digital radiographic unit. And so right now we're probably running about 50% of clinics have a digital radiographic system. And a lot of times the reason isn't because they don't want to get a digital radiographic system. It's because of the infrastructure that requires you to have a digital radiographic system. Once you get that, then you're going to have to be able to look at it somewhere. So you're going to have to get computers. You're going to have to figure out what this whole cloud thing is and when's it going to rain. All that sort of stuff really <laughs> makes no sense. And then, you know, it's great if you get a tablet or an iPad because it can all just beam there electronically. But somebody actually has to take care of all that stuff for you and a lot of people don't want to pay for that infrastructure. That being said, 
digital is becoming much, much more um, rampant. It's becoming much less expensive, which is really helpful too. But then we have to start talking about well, what makes a radiographic study. Before, radiographic studies were based off of how fast, you know, how long it took. You know, a hand tank was like 10, 15 minutes. That's where the term ret wet read came from. If anybody knows, and if somebody says, hey, I'm going to do a wet read, it's because they would take it out of the hand tank and they'd look at it in the light and uh, in the red light, which because you couldn't use the, the, the white light. And you kind of look at it and say, oh, yeah, okay, it looks okay. And then you had to keep developing it. So, but it was still wet. So thus the term wet read. Um, but you know, with automatic processors, then it's like 90 seconds. But we haven't really changed. People are like, oh, I'll just get a single lateral view. I'll just get two views. But we're going to talk about, especially with thorax, going up to three view radiographs. How do we look at a radiograph? It's changed, right? Before we had view boxes. Now most people walk down the hallway and look at it on the light. Uh, but with especially with uh, digital radiographs, now uh, the FDA says that iPads, uh, you know, tablets work really well uh, for for preliminary reads, just because the retina displays and the high resolutions are just as good as medical grade monitors. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about how your mind is working against you and how to do a systematic approach. And then just, you know, all the funny things that we can do to, to mess with our mind with some nice optical illusions that you have to get around. Because when you're looking at a thorax, the biggest problem with thorax is there's just it's visual overload. There's too much stuff going on. You've got airways, you've got vasculature, you've got a heart, you've got lungs, but you also get kind of distracted by that cranial admin. It's like, ooh, shiny. And, uh, and so you kind of get distracted by so much. You've got a musculoskeletal system. You've got, you know, you've got the shoulders in here and all that sort of stuff. And especially when you think, oh, you know what? One of the biggest problems we ran into with digital is people don't actually position as much anymore. It's the first thing that goes away. Now that you can just fire, 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 and you get this digital radiographs, we're finding we're taking so many more radiographs because people are like, it's just like Vegas. They're just going in there and rolling the dice, right? They'll throw them on the table and say, please be straight, please be straight, ah. Oh. And then they go back in and try to, try to adjust it because this is a very oblique radiograph. You can kind of see as we're looking around that you have these rib heads that are not superimposed over these these rib heads. And you can imagine the, the one thing, digital radiograph is great because we really don't have technique problems anymore. Because we these digital radiographs can actually deal with a fourfold overexposure or underexposure. So you could basically just close your eyes, set it, and basically shoot. It's amazing. Our technique charts have gone from these KVP and MAS charts to basically being small dog, medium dog, large dog, and you'd have thorax and abdomen because KVP and MAS don't control contrast anymore with digital, whereas it did when you were kind of dealing with it. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't, you can't still use your technique chart. It'll make the image look better, but it'll still be diagnostic if you just do the small, medium, and large. And so it kind of worked out really well, except when people started using the abdomen technique for like a stifle, and then it burns it out, and so you lose that information. But the thing it doesn't fix is positioning. And so, you know, whereas before, I tell you what, when I was going through and we had, we had automatic processors and when I, when I heard about hand tanks, I mean, those techs were meticulous because they had one shot because they knew that they wouldn't know for 15 minutes whether that shot was good. So, I mean, they were like protractoring and looking at it and, you know, trying to figure it out. Had like three other people come in and say, hey, what do you think? Um, and they'd be like, oh, let's just do a little more wedge pad. Now it's just, you know, kind of like, eh, let's just keep going and you just look. And so radiation exposures are going up. But the idea is making sure that you get a straight radiograph from an interpretive point of view makes life a lot easier because as soon as you start obliquing things, anatomy gets different. Right? And so it's harder. And one of the things I always talk about is that when you're trying to interpret a thoracic radiograph especially, you know, you want to give yourself the best chance. And that's one of the reasons why we talk about taking two views. But if you take a third view, then that's like 33% more information that you're going to have, a better chance for you to be able to see something. So the more images you take, the more information you get. And so that's one of the things that also helps you out, especially since it doesn't cost any more money. I mean, realistically, everybody from storage fees only charge per study. They don't charge per film. That's mainly from CTs and MRIs because they realized they couldn't charge you like two cents a film and we do like a thousand images on CT and they're like, money? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't work very well. So they don't care whether you take three views or seven views. And so one of the things that we did was we actually just started creating a study fee. And we said, you know, if you're getting a radiographic, we're going to just charge you for a study and the study will be as many radiographs as we want to take. 
So that way you take the decision from the client. Because how many times have we had to walk into that client room and said, you know, I got these two radiographs and I'd really love a third view. It's going to be $22 more. And they're like, I think you're fine. <laughs> really? I appreciate that. What medical basis? I don't want to pay $22. <laughs> okay. Just checking. We're on the same page. So, so that's kind of the, one of the things you have to kind of worry about. Because what you're doing with a radiograph is you're taking a three-dimensional object and you're squishing it into two dimensions. So the hard part comes down to is now you've lost all depth. And because you've lost depth, that's why you have to take what we call orthogonal radiographs or a radiograph at a 90 degree angle. So that way you can see from one side to the other. Because if I just take a ventral dorsal radiograph, that means anything from the sternum all the way to the spine is going to be superimposed. Or if you take a lateral radiograph, then everything from the right side to the left side will be superimposed. Best case scenario that you learned about this, we had this one dog came in, big pulmonary mass, like three centimeter pulmonary mass, just right over the caudal dorsal lung. And we were just like, wow, that's amazing. You saw on the lateral radiograph, we said, okay, let's do a VD. We did a VD, yeah, everything's fine. We went to roll them over on the other side, and all of a sudden, this huge tick exploded, like just blood everywhere. And we took the radiograph, and lo and behold, the tumor was gone. We cured cancer right there. Because it turned out that when you think about a, a, t a tick, it's a soft tissue opacity surrounded by air, right? It's just room air. It just happens to be in the lung. So it'll superimpose, and it was dorsal enough that even on the VD, it looked like it was in the lung. But if you actually just ran your hands across the dog, you'd realize it was actually on the surface. And we get a, a lot of problems with pulmonary nodules and nipples, right? You get a dog that's in heat, and he has a, she has a really big nipple right over top of her thorax. It's going to look like a tumor. And so a lot of times, we'll just take a little bit of barium and just put it right on the nipple. We call it a nipple gram because we think it's funny. And uh, <laughs> take a radiograph and we go, oh, look, that's not a pulmonary nodule. And it's, and it's really bad, especially in cancer patients, because we'll get calls all the time that they're saying, hey, is this a tumor or not? And you're like, man, I'd love to call this nipple, but I don't know. And I'm not sure that I can say that it's not cancer, but I would really love a different view so that I can try to, try to figure it out or just coat the nipples and that might help us figure out that this is truly a nipple. Because again, it's all superimposed, so it makes it very difficult. So that's why we like to take two, two views. Because here's just a cat, six month old cat, presents to you, you know, inappetent. Which is weird for a cat, but maybe he's just scared. And you look at this lateral radiograph and realistically nothing should jump out at you except for maybe the fact that we usually don't see the spleen on a lateral radiograph. So that's kind of a little bit of a weird thing for a cat. I mean, his urinary bladder looks fine, good cirrhosal detail, stomach's here, comes the liver, you know, you got the cordial part. I know we're supposed to talk about thorax, but this was kind of cool because when we took the orthogonal radiograph, we realized that all of his uh, intestines were actually next to his body wall. And so he had a huge abdominal hernia. But because we laid him in left lateral recumbency, it all just pushed back into his abdomen, so we didn't notice it. So you take one view, and you're not going to see these sort of things. And that's where you kind of end up having to break that trend of saying, I'm just going to take a quick lateral radiograph. Or the one thing that always kind of gets us as radiologists is that people are like, well, you know what, he's got a cough, but I'm not going to take a radiograph. We'll just treat him with antibiotics. Because 80% of the time, it's not going to be its not going to be anything. It's going to resolve on its own. And that's true. And probably the biggest frustration that most people have and the reason they're not going to, to take that radiograph is because realistically, you guys should be taking 80 to 90% of your radiograph should be normal. And that's drives people nuts because they're like, oh, I'm not going to take normal radiographs. But what we're finding is the fact that people, especially with digital, are starting to take about 33 to 40% more radiographs, that we're catching diseases earlier and we're able to do more stuff to fix them. Because now, all of a sudden, rather than waiting for two months on cancer that you've been treating with antibiotics for a cough, and now it's all metastatic, we're catching it because you take the radiographs right away, you see the nodules, and we're able to get it to an oncologist, and they can actually put them into remission faster. So you know, a, a lot of people say, well, I can't justify taking normal radiographs. I mean, dogs cough, and it's fine. Maybe we'll just take, we'll, we'll try <coughs> treating them. But this way, you kind of know what you're going to treat. And that's what radiographs really help you with. Because like I said, if it doesn't change your plan, great. But if you see something, now all of a sudden, maybe you actually see aspiration pneumonia, and you realize that three to five days antibiotics isn't going to cut it, you're going to have to do seven to 10 days. And at least now you know what you're treating. And you can treat it more aggressively. And if you see it on radiographs, it helps tell us that we can retake radiographs to see if it's getting better or worse. So those are some things that kind of help you if you're having a hard time justifying, well, why would I even take a radiograph? 
we're finding the more radiographs they're taking primarily when you guys get to see it, the easier it is for us when it gets referred to be able to, to know what we're treating and to guide the treatment therapies. Or when you send it for teleradiology, the more we can help you. So it does help a lot because the earlier we can see things, the more, more we can deal with. Of course, the case I'm going to show you are like old because they're so dramatic. But I gave you some, some subtle stuff. So what about the importance of technique? So I keep this on for the film people because overexposure and underexposure was a huge problem. And it still kind of is even with when you're not paying attention with digital, but it's just harder. Like if you mess up a digital radiograph, you have to really try at it. You're like taking it and cranking it up, uh, you know, and you're just like, gosh, I wonder how high this KVP goes. <laughs> and just like the chihuahua's looking at you like, really? Um, but I've never seen anybody catch fire, so it's OK. But but you want to make sure that you kind of, uh, you know, it, you lose information with overexposure more so than underexposure. But the hard part comes down to is we always thought with digital, it's actually more efficient with a digital detector than it was with, with film. So we could actually decrease our dose probably by about half of what we're taking. Uh, we keep the KVP settings about the same as what you take now, but you could probably cut your MAS in half because what it needs is the photons kind of hitting the detector for you to see it. The problem is if you do that, it becomes kind of grainy, and especially if you want to zoom in or if you want that kind of crisp detail, you lose that when you use less uh, radiation. So what we found is that most people actually up the dose a little bit because it makes it really pretty. And so we're finding that rather than saving the dose a little bit, which they're kind of doing in human medicine because there's this big uproar, I don't know, about you know irradiating people. But in dogs, we're like, yeah, fire. Um, <laughs> so, so what we're trying to say is that you know radiation safety is just as big of a concern in, in small animals as it is in humans, and we just need we don't see it as much because we don't really, you know, the dogs don't complain. And so that's why as, as technicians and as, as veterinarians, we have to kind of really kind of start thinking more about Alara or as low as reasonably achievable, which is what we kind of apply to our personnel, and start applying it to the animals too. Um, you know, if you've heard low dose CT is this huge thing that they're doing now where they're actually cutting the dose by about a factor of four for CT scans for people. And most of that is because the CT scans, we do CT scans like to every two months on people just to kind of look at stuff. And, uh, and the radiation is just so huge. In veterinary medicine, it's probably not as important because dogs are not getting that many serial CT scans. But the theory still comes down to is, especially if you're taking radiographs on a dog every two or three weeks looking at the abdomen, you might want to start thinking, hey, that might be a lot of radiation. So, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And that's really where the exposure is useful as well. Because if you generate an overexposed radiograph, then that's kind of useless radiation. And you kind of end up going down that path. The other thing that's also hard is when somebody all of a sudden brings you something you've never seen before. Rabbits. Oh, my god. You're like, oh, what am I supposed to do with that? Um, but turtles and uh, birds, this is a bird on the other side. Both of them have big eggs, so it works out really well. Like the, the, this bird right here, you can see has this nice egg bound. Uh, is, is kind of in there, and then the turtle has a nice little egg coming in right here. But the theory comes down to is that radiographs are radiographs, and you can base it all on opacity. So don't freak out. The hardest part that most people kind of have is you always wonder when radiologists describe something and then we give you a diagnosis. You're so like, gosh, that seems so. Why don't you just tell me what it is? The hard part is that if I just tell you what I think is going on, I can never make new diagnoses, right? I can only tell you the things I've already seen. And so if I describe it, now all of a sudden I can start kind of going down the path of, okay, this doesn't fit anything that's normal, and we have to try to fit outside the box. I mean, how many times have you looked at a radiograph on a cat that's coughing? And it has no sign of asthma whatsoever, but you're going to give them asthma anyway. It's sort of like this idea that you're going to take that square peg and you're going to make it go into that round hole because you have a pre kind of this preconceived uh, notion of what this animal should have, and so you see what you want to see, and that's the hardest part. But the easiest thing that I can tell you, and the first thing that's going to try to try to free your mind a little bit, is realize that normal radiographs are okay doesn't mean that they're not sick, it just means it's not that bad. And it also means that radiographs may not help you in the future to figure out if he's getting better or worse. So you don't have to make up a mild bronchial lung pattern. Because if you don't see anything, then okay, maybe it's upper respiratory is the cause for the cough. Or maybe the cough is just mild enough that it's an allergen or something, but you don't have changes in the lungs yet. 
it's sort of like blood work, right? I mean, all because if he's vomiting, he's got normal blood work. It's not like you can go, oh, well, he's not vomiting anymore. Blood work's normal. So, you know, you just have to kind of realize that not all diagnostic procedures are going to actually answer the question. And the easiest thing I can also tell you is books are your friend. Because, again, one of the hardest parts is when you've been out in practice for a while, the first thing that you start realizing is that you go from having, it's sort of, actually, I won't even say the practice in radiographs. Let's go from surgery and antibiotics, right? When you start off in surgery, you had all these antibiotics when you got out of vet school. You're like, I know all of them. And when you're done, you're probably down to one. I'm going to give him this. And, and you're sort of like, okay, because it's just what you get used to. And that's what happens with radiographs as well. You start seeing the common things commonly, which is fine. But one of the best parts about teleradiology now is the fact that you can have this other person that can kind of give you some other differentials. Because at the end of the day, there's so many more things, and especially now that, that we have emergency critical care, who has created all these acronyms like SARS and, or, and ARDS and SIRS, which is basically acute respiratory distress syndrome, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, all these sort of syndromes that there are a lot more diagnoses than when we just had bronco, interstitial, and alveolar lung patterns. And I know everybody's like, oh, lung patterns. Don't worry, we'll get there. It's fine. Um, but the theory comes down to is don't only try to use words that make sense to you. Like if you don't understand what an interstitial lung pattern is, then it shouldn't be in your medical record. You should basically describe something that, that makes sense to you. It's the reason why in the human medicine they've actually gotten rid of that. And they use two different terms. They use airway and airspace. Airway is what we'd call bronchial lung patterns. Like it's in the airways, the airways are thick. Everything else is airspace. It's basically the idea of it being in the parenchyma because they found that trying to differentiate between interstitial and alveolar didn't make a lot of difference diagnostically. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about as well. So make things that make sense to you. You're writing a medical record for yourself, not necessarily for other people. And what you want to do is when you come back to it in two months, you want to actually understand what that meant. Like if you say you have a mild bronchial lung pattern, how helpful is that going to be to you? But if you say, oh gosh, you know, I, I think I see some, some areas where the bronchi look thick, well, then I understand that, okay, that's, that's where you're coming from with your mild bronchial lung pattern. Or, hey, this lung looks more opaque than it should be. Those sort of things, it may not sound as descriptive, but as long as it's making sense to you that you can explain and you can relate what you're doing, because the key is when you write something down that you don't have to pull up the radiograph again. You can basically just look at it and from that description decide whether or not the radiograph looks worse or better when you retake it. It's just trying to save you some time. So that brings you to what about viewing radiographs? Do you do it in a dimly lit room like this or do you do it in a bright hallway like that? How does the whole thing work? And this is where you kind of get into this idea of physiology of your eye. And it turns out that you have rods and cones like we all know and, and your, your uh, rods are basically your night vision so it's kind of gives you your blacks and whites and your cones are giving you color. And so you can imagine that cones are actually very, very uh, good at dealing with light. Rods are very bad. It's their low-level uh, vision. So if you want the trivia of why uh, pirates wore eye patches, the idea was that they would wear an eye patch not because they lost their eye, which would have been much cooler, but it was because they realized very early on that when they stowed a whole bunch of gunpowder in the decks of ships, that going down with candles was kind of counterproductive. So what they did was they'd actually wear an eye patch on one eye that they could kind of maintain their night vision, and their other eye would be bright so that they could go out on the deck. And so when they were on the deck, they'd have one eye up, and when they went down below deck, they would flip their patch to the other eye to keep that eye to basically be able to do day vision, and the other eye to be night vision and so that way they could kind of go back and forth. So why is that important to you? Well for one it's kind of cool and it was on Mythbusters so it has to be right. <laughs> but mainly it's because when we're looking at images everything we look at is black and white right? So we're trying to use our rods to be able to see black and white and to be honest we can only see a hundred shades of gray. So I'm not quite sure this whole 50 shades like if he only has like one eye or something but I'm sure it's a radiology movie and they've got like sequels so it's got to be cool. Um, but the idea is that if you're trying to look at a grayscale image with your color vision, 
It's very hard and it's very straining to your eye. It's the reason why if you go out and you stare at a computer screen or play video games or anything, in about an hour or two your eyes kind of hurt and that's because color vision is very taxing on your, on your eyes. Whereas grayscale imaging is actually very easy to look at. It's the reason why Kindles and all these readers are black and white because you can stare at those for hours and it doesn't strain your eye. So that's the reason why also that they came out with medical grade monitors. One of the biggest questions we always get is, hey, these 7,000 medical grade monitors because they say medical. I'm a veterinarian. I'm a doctor. I want something that says medical. Great. I can tell you that from our standpoint as a radiologist, they are phenomenal because I can stare at a medical grade monitor for 10 to 12 hours and not need glasses. But if I stare at my computer screen for like two or three hours, I need to take a break. So that's really what medical grade monitors are for is if you feel that you're going to be sitting for long periods of time looking at images, Absolutely, medical grade monitors are great. And, and sure, they might have a little bit more diagnostic accuracy, but most of the time they're saying that aside from being brighter and crisper and clearer, that diagnostically people aren't making more diagnoses on medical grade monitors than they are from regular monitors. The, medic, the, the regular monitors nowadays are three to four megapixel monitors, so that means that they have really high resolution. That's what these 4K and 5K monitors are actually five, six megapixel monitors. Probably more resolution than we need for a radiograph of a dog. But the theory comes down to is that how much is it straining your eyes? And that's really what grayscale imaging is all about. So why is this important? Again, having a room that's lit sort of in this level is actually really good for you. It's not completely dark because that's going to be straining to your eye as well. Sort of like driving at night and headlights coming kind of hurts. Same basic principle. Having a low level of light is good. But it's also why if you're walking down the hallway and you have film and you hold it up to an incandescent light, that's not going to work out very well for you either because it's just hard for your, your mind to grasp those colors. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at it. So you want to make sure you have a dim quiet, uh, a dim light for viewing. And I love this. This was actually um, uh, this idea of having a quiet, undisturbed place. Let's face it, no place on earth in your clinic is quiet and undisturbed. But if you can actually realize that taking and looking at a radiograph, especially a thoracic radiograph, probably will take you somewhere between two and three minutes if you're focused on it. That you can actually look at that radiograph in two to three minutes and see anything that you need to see because it has your undivided attention. And you're going to do a much better job than trying to do it between exam rooms. So you just give yourself some time, and whether or not that time is pre-dedicated time, or maybe that's your time that you're actually going to eat a banana, and you're going to find out that you're going to have to drink something. And you say, okay, while I'm drinking something, I'm going to look at this radiograph. That's it. That's as much time as you need. But take that time. And honestly, I think that's really where teleradiology has kind of helped most people, is it's buying you time. Because what happens is, we're sitting there, with just no distractions and, under, and, and able to do what you're not having time to do. And then we'll give you that result back. But one thing I'll tell you is that we're giving you this report as a consult, right? We're not giving you this report as, as gospel. We're trying to tell you, hey, this is what I see. Do you agree? And that's why it's so much better when you have a, a history that you send it and say, hey, I've looked at this sorax and I see this weird lesion here. Do you agree? And then it becomes much more of a consultation than it does, hey, I don't have time to look at this. What do you think? And then we come back and say, well, I don't really see much. What's going on with the animal? Or can I have some history, please? I don't want to bias you. Radiology is a team sport. Like It's very hard for us to create... Uh, you know, because uh, create a diagnosis out of things because especially with thoraxes, it's like every differential under the sun. So, and I mean, trust me, it's not just us. I actually, when I was at Michigan State, it was really funny. We sent up a case to histopath, I think it was cytology, and uh, it came back as this is either normal or cancer. And I was like, wow, thank you for that. That's really helpful. I was on the fence. I thought it might have been something else, but now at least I've narrowed it down to cancer or normal. So, uh, so you know, we want to make sure that our radiology reports are helpful, and a lot of people say they're not helpful because they give you so many differentials, you knew that before you took the radiograph. And that's probably much more of a, an idea of history and signalment, which helps us kind of delve down in what differentials are possible. And if you don't give us that, then basically we can say, okay, you have a caudal dorsal interstitial lung pattern 
These are all the differentials for caudal dorsal interstitial lung patterns. You know, does he have mast cell? Oh yeah, it turns out he does have mast cell. Oh well, it could be mast cell disease. You know, these are sort of the things that can gauge, but the exact same radiographic pattern, and I tell you, when I was a resident, this drove me nuts. I had no idea when all of a sudden my mentor would go up and say, oh, that, this guy has lymphoma. And then all of a sudden you'd be like, this one has heart failure. And you're like, dude, they look exactly the same. How do you know this? He's like, I read the history. <laughs> like, oh. Because radiographic patterns are not specific. You know, the location's helpful, but there's nothing about it that just jumps out at you. There are certain things that are pathognomonic, but not many. And so those are some of the things that we'll cover to try to help you out with that. But the biggest key is don't rush. And also, don't try to create lesions that aren't there. Like I said, my biggest thing, one of the mentors that I had, his, his big uh, statement was that every animal that you look at, you should consider normal, and it has to work really hard to be abnormal, rather than the other way around. Like you have to kind of say, well, how am I wrong? that I see this. Probably the easiest question on that is right-sided heart disease. Because anytime you think right-sided heart disease, really you're only talking about two differentials. He either got pulmonic stenosis or he's got pulmonary hypertension. Those are kind of the two things that cause it, whether your pulmonary hypertension is usually heartworm disease. So if you say he's got right-sided heart failure, you have to realize that you're telling me he's got one of these two diseases. And now I just, and every time somebody says that, I say, okay, which, two, which one of these two does he have? How old is he? Six months old, well, he's got to have pulmonic stenosis. No, he doesn't have a murmur. Then it's probably not right-sided heart disease, right? So that's one of the things that's a little bit helpful when you start thinking through. But, you know, gone are the days where we're, like, in this little crowd, this little dark room, staring really close, getting sunburned from the uh, UV radiation coming off of these light boxes. Like, we just don't do that. I mean, there's just not time. Uh, usually we're in a hallway, a pretty brightly lit hallway. Or, to be honest, now it's all on computer screens, right? When the question is, what kind of computer screens do you need, I think... The big key is, is just on volume and throughput. And, and realize that if you're trying to buy like two $7,000 medical grade monitors, the first question is, what's your return on that investment? Like, are you really seeing that many radiographs or would it be easier to take that $14,000 and invest it in something like, I don't know, an ultrasound machine or something like that? That may be more useful, dental radiography, something. So, so kind of think about what your bang for the buck is gonna be when you start looking at it. Because I can tell you that I would never trade my medical grade monitors for anything, but that being said, I look at a lot of radiographs, so it kind of helps my eyes. And I put this one on here for two reasons. One is because just in case Amy Habing ever gets a chance to see this, she's one of the residents, um, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that she can see herself. But mainly it's because most people don't even know what this thing is. And that's just a hot light, if you kind of remember from when you had film. Uh, this is a foot pedal that we just used as a hand switch. But the idea is overexposure was able to be compensated for. And that's why most places will rather overexpose than underexpose when you take a radiograph. Because usually you could get, you get some information with a hot light, right? And so you could kind of deal with overexposure. But that's one of the things that's kind of gone away with the idea of uh, digital but the other thing that went away is this idea that you actually physically had film which is great right so now all of a sudden if the owner wants a copy you can basically just burn them a CD or send them an email link now and I mean it's so much more useful and user-friendly because now the films can stay with you and it was interesting because I just took a license exam in, in Nevada and that was one of the big keys that I guess I kind of has lost on me but just remember that when you take a radiograph the veterinarian that has ordered that radiograph, that who, who owns the study. It doesn't matter that somebody else paid for it. It's actually your property because, let's face it, when the board comes to you and asks you for those radiographs, they're not going to call the owner and say, hey, I need those radiographs back. They're going to call you. And so by having this as a digital copy, you never lose it. And that's one of the things that's very helpful. And I kind of kind of lost sight of that because especially from the equine room, we always think, wait, hey, when somebody does a pre-purchase exam, that person owns those films, but that's not the case. It's always you as the veterinarian or the clinic that owns those, those films. Throwing this in just from the idea of, you know, talking about hanging protocols and the idea that, you know, when you start thinking about how radiographs are hung, realize we do it the same way. And one of the things about digital is that we actually preset these so that it hangs the same way. But why I wanted to put this in is less about realizing, yes, we always try to put cranial on the left and call on the right, which is going to be helpful when we do our cases. But it's more to kind of make you realize that when you take digital images especially, there is nothing about those labels that are correct. 
right? So the digital labels, they're like, oh, you know what, I'll just put it on after the fact. Or the computer knows when I hit VD, it puts a right and a left on there, and it puts a, a head and a foot on there, so it's got to be right. The computer only knows where the cassette is. Like, it has no idea how that dog is positioned. So if you put the head to the top of your table and the tail at the, the back of your table, if the computer realizes that's, that's the orientation of your cassette, then everything is good. But that's why you still need to be using markers because it is very easy for that to be wrong. Like if you all of a sudden spin the dog the other way, or you flip the radiograph, or you do all these other things, anatomically sometimes we can tell, but I can tell you, especially in a thoracic radiograph, sometimes rights and lefts are really hard. And I've had people that send me three view radiographs that I thought because it was two laterals and a VD, and then I realized it was two right laterals. And you're like, these look remarkably the same, but why would, it's got to be different, and then all of a sudden you realize if they had markers, it would be so much easier. So, you know, you kind of think, well, with digital, I don't need markers anymore. Those markers are still really important because computers can flip things and you wouldn't even know. And so just be careful about that. And we can try to figure our way around it with anatomy, but it's much easier if you, because we like to hang everything the same way, and we like to know, is this a left ladder or a right ladder? Because then we can help figure out, is this the left lung or the right lung, which surgeons kind of like. So, because um, it's not always easy when you look at a radiograph. I mean, you know, let's face it, sometimes you look at a radiograph and you go, gosh, this is the worst case of whatever it is I ever saw. And that works out well, too, because you can kind of realize what I really want you guys to take away from looking at thoracic radiographs is less about the subtleties and the nuances. Because if you're staring at a radiograph and you're leaning in really close and squinting and saying, maybe there's an interstitial lung pattern there, chances are it's not important. Right? We're looking for big things. I want you to have kind of three diagnoses. It's either going to be, oh, there's nothing here, or it's going to be, wow, that's, that's incredible, or there's going to be, meh, which is kind of like, I don't know, halfway in between, maybe there's something, maybe there's not. But the key is don't get stuck on things, because usually what we're looking at is something so diffuse and so bad that it's more that we're trying to figure out what this could be rather than trying to figure out, you know, is, this, is there disease here or not? This dog presents to you for coughing, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. And you can look at it. Now the question is, well, what's causing this coughing? Well, he's got a diffuse lung pattern here. It looks kind of nodular, but how do I know? Is this going to be fungal or is this going to be cancer? Well, a couple questions would be whether or not he has a fever. You know, what's his CBC look like? Because radiographically, I could say it could go either way, right? In this case, this is actually blasto. And so blastomycosis. So, you know, you can kind of end up coming through the idea of trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But just realize when we're looking at this, we always put cranial to the left and caudal to the right. We put dorsal at the top and ventral at the bottom. But we do that for repetition purposes. Some people will like to put the left lateral facing the other way. And I can tell you that that's not something we do anymore, mainly because we like mirror images, because it's sort of like where's Waldo, right? You get used to looking at something over and over again. When something's abnormal, it kind of jumps out at you. So the more you can just have that same image over and over in your head, the more you're going to get used to looking at a radiograph and kind of seeing what doesn't quite fit, and then you have to figure it out. Human medicine is actually really cool. They have these machine learnings now. You take a thoracic radiograph of a person, the first thing the computer does is it takes away the rib cage, and then it can just show you the lungs. Then it puts little circles around anything that's abnormal because most humans have about the same lung pattern. And so then a radiologist can just go through and click on each one and decide whether it's normal or abnormal, which is kind of nice. But you can imagine that if you had a chihuahua chest versus a Great Dane chest, like the whole thing would be circled. Like, this, this seems like it's three chihuahuas. Um, so, you know, it's, we're, we're having a hard time with the machine learning, but they are working on it. Uh, IDEX is one of the pioneers of trying to figure out more where they can do machine learning. Their ultimate goal is to basically have an algorithm so you take a radiograph and it either gives you a check mark or an X and basically tells you whether it's normal or abnormal. Won't tell you what it is, but it'll just tell you, okay, this is normal, or hey, there's something here that's not normal. And, uh, and that's going to be the first step, because they figure then it could, you could kind of help triage and decide which ones need to be sent and which ones don't. So that's, that's one of the goals that people are looking at.
So when we do the ventral dorsal, this kind of freaks some people out sometimes, but remember we always put right on the left and left on the right. And this is going to be important when we do the cases, but just realize, I mean, this flipped out some people because they were like, well, what about DVs versus VDs? And that's the whole point. Like we want to make sure that we're always looking at it the same way, even though the heart may shift one way or another. And we do that just so that we can kind of look at it the same way every time. So heart position may change, but you always want to make sure right's on your left and left's on your right. So it's almost like you're always looking straight down at the animal just to kind of help you try to figure out whether or not things are straight. In this case, you can see that we actually have this right middle lung lobe that's got, got a, a increased soft tissue opacity, which is an alveolar lung pattern. You have this nice low bar sign. So you can see that you have normal lung here. You have abnormal lung here. So you have a sharp demarcation between the two, which helps tell you that that's an alveolar lung pattern. Realistically, this came down to a puppy that, that had aspiration pneumonia. But it would be helpful to have more views, right? Because, I mean, you look at it, unless I told you that, and that's one of the hard parts, especially when you get a lecture, because you'll look at it and somebody will be like, oh, yeah, this turns out to be this. What you didn't see was like the 10 hours of us scratching our head trying to figure out what it was. Um, and so that's one of the things that you kind of have to keep in mind is that a lot of times we don't look at these things and go, oh, yeah, that was, that was malignant histiocytosis. Most of the time we kind of looked at it and went, oh, yeah, that looks bad. We should get a sample of it. Um, because radiology is not histopath. And I think that's one of the hardest parts that we're dealing with, especially with thorax, because I can tell you right now, thoracic radiology was the hardest part of our board exams because it, you don't get very deep in your differential list. Like they give you a case, you see some, some stuff and you're like, okay, it could be this, 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 and this. And they're like, okay, thank you. I can tell you the other thing that was really fun when I was on the executive council, one of the first things we wanted to do is we take 12 thoracic radiographs for our budding radiologists when they, when they take boards. And they just sit in a room and they look at each one and somebody listens to them as they blather on about what they think is going on. So we thought, wouldn't it be great to give them 12 normal thoracic radiographs? <laughs> we figured by about the third one, they would actually make up stuff that just did not exist. But, and by about the fifth one, they'd probably jump out the window or just be like, I'm done. Um, but normal thoraxes are like the hardest things to diagnose. Like nobody wants to, right? You're always like, dude, there's got to be something in there. And, and it's, it's okay, but also make sure you're looking inside the trachea. Probably one of the things that most people don't look at. Look in the airways, not just the fact that he has a trachea, but is it collapsed? Is it, it, does it have things inside of it? Look outside the box as well. Make sure you're checking out the diaphragm and all that sort of good stuff. Because, you know, once you get a properly posi positioned radiograph, the interpretation is the hardest part, right? And so that's one of the things that takes experience, it takes time, but one of the things it also takes is outside the box thinking an open mind. I can't tell you how many times we get presented with a case that, you know, it presents for coughing. They give them three milligrams per kilogram of Lasix IV, which is a huge rescue dose of, of Lasix because they think he's got heart failure. Great. Two hours later, still coughing, still oxygen dependent. Take a radiograph, no change. Three milligrams per kilogram IV of Lasix. Four hours later, still no change. Three milligrams per kilogram IV of Lasix. You're like, dude, it's not working. So like, now all of a sudden we go from the idea of cardiogenic pulmonary edema to the fact that it's probably non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right? And so if it's not working, keeping that idea that it's okay to give a treatment, but be like house, right? You, get things wrong three or four times and all of a sudden he comes up with it. He's like, oh yeah, it happens to be this. And they give him like a can of Coke. And he's like, you're fine. And, uh, and so same basic principle when you start looking at these. So make sure you're looking at the whole radiograph. That's really important. Um, you know, one of the things that you can end up kind of dealing with is some people say, hey, what I need to do is I be, need to be organized. I work from the outside in, sternum to spine and all the way in between. Or maybe I work from the center of the heart all the way out. They did a study. They looked at all these people that they gave them two choices. They said, okay, do it. Do you do an organized approach? Do you do a non-organized approach where you just randomly look at the thorax? No difference between the two, as long as you're looking at everything. The hardest part is when something's obvious. When something's obvious, you're like, ooh, shiny, and then you forget about everything else. And so that's one of the biggest problems that you run into. So just kind of, kind of deal with that. It's actually really funny. They did this experiment where they took CT scans and they put a, a monkey inside the thorax of the lungs. Uh, or inside the lungs of this, this chest, and they said, okay, I want you to look for Mets. So they turned the first group, okay, look for Mets. And because Mets are usually white, nobody saw the monkey whatsoever. But when they told the other, next group, hey, I just want you to look at the thorax, they looked through it, and all of a sudden, 
everybody was like, hey, there's like this little dark monkey on there. So if you're focused on one thing, it's very easy for you to miss a lot of other things. So that's just something else to kind of bear in mind. You know, don't, you don't have to, if somebody taught you you have to do it this way, realize it doesn't matter. It's like you going into an art museum and saying, you know what, you got to look at it really close and then work your way back. Whatever works for you, the big key is to be systematic. Make sure you're looking at it the same way. And I can tell you that if you ever saw somebody who says you have to do it this way, or like for me, I'll tell you, biggest thing I always do is I always look at the edges of the film just to make sure. And the only reason is because I've been burned, right? It's the only reason why anybody does anything, because I missed a lesion on the edge of the film once, and I just say to myself, I'm not going to miss that again. I missed a rib tumor once. I'm not going to miss a rib tumor again. Those sort of things. Once you miss something, that's how you grow. So a lot of people are afraid to miss make a choice because they don't want to be wrong. But I'll tell you the first thing is that if you're not wrong, then you're not pushing yourself, right? And I know that's kind of a cheesy thing to say, but it's true. You got to make sure that you're working your way and you're making yourself get make a choice. It's like being a weatherman. We're, we're lucky if we're right 80% of the time, right? But we're trying to give you a choice and give you a direction that you can rule in or rule out disease. I had this one, it was a nasal mask that I was looking at for Dr. Wang. And I said, well, okay, I think this, this can either be lymphoma or it might be, it might be a different tumor or you know what? I, and she was like, oh yeah, it turned out it was a foreign body. And you're like, oh, I'll add that to my differential list next time. <laughs> Good to know, I would never have called that. And she's like, but you know, the whole idea is you figured out that it was a mass and realized differential diagnoses are what can be wrong, right? And that's why descriptions should never be wrong. Like, you're just telling me what you see. If you look at a cloud and you say, gosh, I see a rabbit, and I go, no, nah, it looks like Superman. I mean, who's right on that? Like, it's, it's an interpretation. So just realize that really where you're going to skew is where you're going to deal with your differentials. And it's okay because you're applying your knowledge and your guess, your best guess, when it comes down to interpreting a radiograph. So like, for the example, this dog, 10-year-old mixed breed dog, Presented for a mild cough and uh, elevated white blood cell count. And so you're looking at the thorax and you're like, eh, you know, I don't see anything. Granted, I only gave you one view, but I can tell you all the other views were pretty similar. But what's really interesting is if a lot of times when you're looking at it, you're kind of focusing on the heart, you're focusing on the lungs. And what you don't focus on is the spinous processes and all these lytic lesions. And this guy actually had multiple myeloma. And, uh, and it's very easy to miss because it's not what you're looking for, right? And so you got to be careful about some of these things, especially when they present for weird stuff. Like he's got a cough, but he's also ataxic in the pelvic limb. <laughs> so when you kind of do that, you know, sometimes you look and you realize he doesn't have any spinous processes. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. So those sort of things kind of help you out when you're kind of going through it. Because when you're looking, just realize there are only five opacities. So it's not that hard. When you say there's an increased opacity, you're sort of like, you know, in the lungs there's an increased opacity. You're like, dude, air's at the bottom. So that's like saying someone is better than me at basketball. Like, that's not setting a high bar. <laughs> like, I suck at basketball. So, you know, you kind of end up kind of dealing with this idea that if you want to say there's an increased soft tissue opacity in the lungs, call your shot. Is it fat? Is it soft tissue? Is it fluid? You know, a lot of people will say there's a fluid opacity in the plural space, or they'll say it's a soft tissue opacity in the plural space, and then conclude plural fluid. Like, they're t telling some sort of... Uh, you know, like a mystery novel. I wonder what it's going to be. But if you think it's fluid, just say there's fluid opacity in the thorax. You might go, well, soft tissue and fluid are the same. Exactly. So why are you trying to parse it between the two? Is there a mass effect? Do you think it's soft tissue or do you think it's fluid? Mineral, easy, and then metal. Those are kind of the five. There's no plastic opacity. There's no wood opacity. There's no, no other opacity. There's just those five and everything else kind of runs in between. But a lot of people, when they start looking at it, they start assigning this idea of density. And so you kind of say, gosh, this is much more dense. And realize density really doesn't have a lot to do with opacity. A little bit, but when you think about it, I can have the exact same dense material, but if it's bigger, then it's going to attenuate more x-rays than the smaller amount of fat. Like if I have a really fat cat, and you guys know, like the 30-pound cat that comes and just, just like, basically like Jabba the Hutt and just kind of oozes over your table and you take a radiograph and you go, gosh, his lungs look really opaque. That's not his lungs. That's the fact that he has three other cats wrapped around <laughs> his thorax when it comes down to it because when you kind of look at a radiograph, the nice part is every piece of 
of opacity is usually represented. So for example, in this kind of cranial abdomen, you can see you have gas in the lung, you're going to have fat of the falciform fat, you know, you soft tissue associated with the liver, or in the case of the thorax, the heart. You can might have a metallic foam body, but honestly the marker is a good metal comparison. And then mineral is going to be all the bones. So all you have to do is matching at that point. You just have to look at one and then look at the other and see which ones kind of align the best, and that usually works out really well because there's so many things that radiographic opacity depends on. And some of it is atomic number and physical density, but most of it is thickness and what's surrounding it, because that's going to really depend on what we see. And the only reason why we have any sort of detail in the abdomen is because of these different contrasts. The only reason why I can see the heart is because it's surrounded by air-filled lung. If I have a huge amount of fluid in the thorax that's around that heart, then I can't see the heart anymore because it's silhouettes, right? So those are some of the things to keep in mind. And again, if all of a sudden I have the exact same material, but one's thicker than the other, well then that means the x-rays are going to be more attenuated, so A is going to be brighter than B. It's not because it's more dense, it's just there's more of it. And so those are some of the things to kind of keep in mind. Because when you start thinking about it, the idea is some things are really easy to recognize. And this is very easy when you start deciding, wouldn't it be a great idea to feed the pill to my Labrador Retriever with peanut butter on a, on a spoon? And then Three seconds later, you realize not such a good idea, and radiographically, you can prove why. Um, but the theory comes down to is that one of the things that's really impressive about our mind is we love shapes. Like, we can't deal without actually making something into something. When was the last time you looked at something and you didn't say, gosh, that looks like a... Like, you know, everything, especially when you think about everything has to be food, right? That tumor looks exactly like cauliflower. Um, we like to associate things with stuff. And that's one of the things that works out really well. But the problem is that everything we interpret has to do with our mind. It has very little to do with our knowledge. It's, it's a perception thing. And so what you kind of end up dealing with is, like, if you've never seen this before, I don't know where you've been, but the idea is... <laughs> What you can see here is you have this, this lady, and she has this, this hat on, right? So this is her hair, no matter which lady you see. Now, you may see one of two. You may see a young lady, or you may see an old lady. If you see the young lady, then this is the side of her face. This is her nose. This is her eyelash. This is her ear. This is her chin. This is a choker that she's wearing, and this is the rest of her neck. If you see the old lady, then this is her nose. This is a wart on her nose. This is one eyelash. This is the other eye. This is the bottom of her nose, and this is her mouth. The interesting part about that is people are like, oh, yeah, I see both. You can't see both at the same time, right? You can either see an old lady or you can see a young woman, but it's almost like a switch goes on in your mind, and it flips back and forth, and that's because you're interpreting. And one of the problems we run into with radiographs is that if you're already interpreting the radiograph before you even look at it, then you're not going to be able to see anything else, right? So you have to kind of keep that open mind, especially when we start showing you these cases, so that you can look at it and you just don't go, oh, that's heart failure. Because it might be, but what else could it be? And that's usually the first question I ask. And that's why, to me, radiology is so fun, because I'm like the naysayer. When somebody comes to me and says, I know exactly what this is, I'm like, so what about... What if, what if it's African swine fever? And you're like, dude, what's that? I have no idea. I just want to throw it out there. So, so you end up kind of end up playing devil's advocate on it because what happens is what you see is what we describe because what you describe should never be wrong. I see that there is no opacity. I see these lines on that picture. But what you can be wrong is is what you think you see, what you perceive. And that's one of the interesting parts about it. Because the more you, you try to interpret it, the more you're going to kind of end up dealing with a lot of what you know and also what you feel, which has nothing to do with radiology whatsoever. But it's what makes you a good radiologist or a good interpreter is because you have experience and you can kind of, kind of mesh things together and you, have ex and you can kind of say, well, I've seen this before. But that's one of the problems we always run into is this idea of, I've seen two other cases like this, so it's probably this. Because even though most things run in threes for some reason, it's not always the case. So you always have to keep that open mind. And so kind of, kind of going down that path and making sure that you're keeping that open mind. Because 
our eyes versus our mind are very tricky, right? So this optical illusion makes no sense if you try to look at it in parts. Like how is it that they're leaning over something and dropping it to a guy that's on a flat surface? But that's why three dimensions and two dimensions don't work. And our mind has to interpret it, and it's okay, but what happens is you have to physically disassociate the two. And you're like, okay, but you kind of override your interpretation. You can do that. And that's one of the hard parts about it because it's all inside your head. And so when you're looking at a radiograph, the first thing you should always do is figure out how can I be wrong? Because I'm looking at a whole bunch of lines and a whole bunch of shades of gray, and it makes so much sense that I've seen a lot of these before, but what is it that I'm missing? What is this? What am I trying to interpret? And that's going to help you out a lot. Because we are very bad about a couple different things. One is we're very bad about going from bright to dark. The other thing that we're really bad at, I mean, our eyes are actually really attuned for motion, not still images. We're really good at being able to see things as they move, but we can't, because we're not really looking at still images, angles, size is always really hard. And that's why it's great that there's calipers now. We used to have rulers. I know, they're weird. They're like these plastic things. They have little notches on them. Now we can actually do that on the image. But the other thing is this mock phenomenon where we can actually, we have a hard time. If we see two different opacities, we have a tendency to try to draw a line in between them where no line exists. And what does that really look like? Some people would believe that the right image has a smaller circle in the center than the left. And that's just depending on what it's surrounded by. And so how does that really work? Like for example, both of those lines on the left are the same length. Both of the circles on the right are the same size even though they don't physically look that way. But we just can't tell because it depends on what it's surrounded by. And that's really the thing that freaks you out. If you're looking at something and say, oh, this looks larger than it was before. My first question to all my residents is measure it because you're going to be wrong more than you're right if you're just eyeballing it. And so just kind of bear that in mind because when you look at it, especially when you have an aerated lung, sometimes hearts look bigger, sometimes heart works, looks smaller. And that's why everybody thinks Jack Russell Terriers pretty much have cardiomegaly just because they have a large amount of thorax, they have a, a heart that's in the center of it, and you're like, gosh, that seems bigger than it should be. But it depends on the size of, of what's surrounding it. That, that's how your mind kind of deals with it. So just be careful about over-interpreting size and shapes. The other thing is that our mind loves to draw connections between things. So for example, there's no circle in there, but because those things are in such close apposition, it's very easy for us to draw a circle around there. And that's one of the things, especially in thoraxes, that's awful because you have a rib, you have a pulmonary blood vessel, you have another rib, and you might have an airway going through and it looks like there's a nodule. And you have to kind of go, okay, let me just take component parts of this and see if it really is a nodule or if I can actually see some of this stuff extending beyond the nodule and maybe this is some sort of artifact. So you have to talk yourself into it. Now this one hurts everybody so I'm really sorry but you can look at it for a minute. Um, that's not flashing. The interesting part about that and I'll put it up again is because you have two optic nerves inside your eye, the one thing you have to realize is, well, I'll go back to this one. One thing you have to realize is when you're looking at that grid pattern, because there's black and white, somewhere in that grid is where your optic nerve is. And your optic nerve is really cool because it can't see. So what happens is instead of having two black dots that are probably right about here in your eyesight, your mind takes all the information around it and fills in that gap. And so because of that, when you're looking at this grid, anywhere you look, there's going to be somewhere where that optic nerve is going to black out. So now everything's going to be flashing black and white. But it does usually strain your eyes a little bit. So sorry about that. But just realize, the other way you can test is if you take a pen and you put it and you just basically start bringing it over to the side, at some point you're going to lose the top or portion of that pen. It's just going to disappear. So kind of an interesting little trivia. And there are no lines in between this. And these are the mock phenomenon. This is what ends up dealing with the fact that, you know, it's, it just shows you that our, our mind does not like our mashed potatoes touching our peas. <laughs> and so when you start looking at it, you can see that you have these white lines and you can see this really sharp demarcation. And where this is important, fascial planes, especially in the limbs. If all of a sudden I have a fascial plane going across the humerus, it'll look like an incomplete fracture because you're going to have this line that you don't quite know about. And the question is, is there periosteal reaction around it? Does it make sense? Is he painful? Like, don't try to overinterpret an image, because I think one of the things that also happens is people look at a radiograph and treat it sort of like it's gospel. Like, they're like, oh my gosh, I see this. It's got to be real. And the question is, how could I be wrong? 
because it's okay, especially when it comes down to aggressive bone lesions, right? If I see an aggressive bone lesion, he's lame on that leg, but it's really, really subtle. Is it okay to treat him with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for two weeks and retake the radiograph and see if it gets worse? Yeah, because the alternative is if you amputate the leg and it wasn't, then you're kind of like, oops. But, but the idea is nothing stays the same, right? So, you know, there's no paper out there that I know of that has ever said that if I actually amputated that leg two weeks earlier, that his prognosis is going to be that much better. And it's much easier for you to err on the side of caution than for you to overinterpret and just jump to conclusions. So just realize when you're kind of dealing with these sort of things that your mind, when we're starting to do these cases, you may never have seen some of these diagnoses before, but that's great because what I'm trying to do is less about the cases and the diagnoses and more about the patterns and realizing that there's going to be some things that you haven't seen, but how are you going to work your way through it? What's your next step? And I think that's really where we've kind of lost sight. And actually a lot of veterinary schools now are changing the way we're teaching veterinary medicine in the fact that we are very, like when we all went through school, we're very goal oriented, right? I mean, you basically, you have a disease, you have some diagnostics, you have the answer. What we're starting to realize is that's not life. Like we generally, we have a disease, we do diagnostics, we have a therapy protocol, and then we hope for the best. Like we're trying to figure out what what the trend is. So we're actually starting to kind of what they call, we can talk about flipping the script or all these different cool terms. But the idea is we're going to start teaching students how to deal with symptoms rather than trying to deal with a disease name. And that's going to be something that's going to try to change how we're kind of working at things because, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I end up not having an answer, like I think this is cancer such as bronchovular carcinoma, people feel slighted. Like they don't quite know, what, well, what do you think it is? And you're kind of like, well, what does it matter? Like if it's cancer, what does it matter the tumor type as much to you because we're just going to take it to oncology and hopefully they'll figure that part out. But that's where we're trying to kind of end up going down this path of I think when you're looking at thoracic radiographs, the big theme that we're going to try to deal with is not getting too specific. Like trying to stay broad on it and then realizing what's my next step. That's probably going to be useful because let's face it, nowhere in the world for some reason people have this expectation they can walk into a veterinary clinic, 20 minutes later, have all their diagnostics done and have an answer and having a treatment and their home. Like, I don't know where this came from, but we're just that good at our job. Whereas on the human side, it's like six weeks, call up, hey, do you have my blood reserve? Not yet, okay. <laughs> but fluffy, man, it's like three minutes later, hey, what did, what did the neurologist think? Neurologist, my brother, like he herniated a disc and he was laying on his back and they're like, oh yeah, the neurologist will look at it in like, like six or eight weeks. And I looked at it, it's like, dude, you got a disc. We should cut you. If you're a dog, you'd be so much better right now. <laughs> so, so I think we have this pressure to be fast and be right. And one of the things I can tell you is that most people have the expectation of three things, right? They want fast, they want accurate, and they want inexpensive. And the easiest thing I can tell you is that most people get one out of the three. You might get two if you're lucky. But just realize that we're holding ourselves to an expectation that may not be achievable. And it's okay to tell people, hey, we're going to try to see what this is. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to focus on. Okay? So just to round out the evening with some fun little cases. Um, you know, the first case actually is one that is probably going to leave you a little bit less excited just because I honestly have no the, don't know the answer. I came in today and they were like, hey, I want you to look at this thoracic radiograph. And I said, okay, I'll take a look at it because they said, this is the weirdest thing we ever saw. And I was like, great. So uh, this was a cat that had a cough. And, uh, and so this was the thoracic radiograph. Yeah, so you look at it and you're like, yep abnormal. And that's really the first question you should ask yourself. Normal versus abnormal. So at least it's sort of like that when you make a to-do list and the first thing you write is to-do list. Check. <laughs> so same basic principle. The question was they had was what is this? And you're like, yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that you kind of look at is, again, overwhelmingly, if you try to take this as a whole, 
it's overwhelming, right? You kind of look at it and you're like, gosh, I don't even know where to start. Are these cavitated nodules? He's got smaller pulmonary nodules in here as well. And so, you know, you kind of see that you have this thicker area here, you have a thicker area here. But what's interesting about it is they do seem to be around airways. And then also in that caudal dorsal lung, you have this large soft tissue bacilli which has a gas opacity within it. So you have a cavitated mass. Now, I don't see distended esophagus cranial to it, so it's probably not in the esophagus. But that's why multiple views are helpful. So here is the other lateral view, which, to be honest with you, not that helpful. But the idea is that you can kind of look at it and say, OK, yeah, I see the other view. I still still kind of see that these circles are kind of seeming to be right with this airway right here. I can see that I have this thick area here. But are these bulla? Or are all of these actually end on airways? And it's hard for me to tell until I go to the ventral dorsal projection. So if these were pulmonary bulla and really thick walled bulla, the first thing you should realize is that should be a sphere, right? It shouldn't be just in one plane. Yet I don't see them on this ventral dorsal projection. Now that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Like I can still see the soft tissue opacity in the left caudal lung lobe right back here. I can see that it has a gas opacity here. So at least I know that he's got a large mass in the dorsal aspect of the left caudal lung lobe. And the medial component to it, which is kind of bad because I can't aspirate that, right? Because it's not against the, the, the body wall, so even ultrasound doesn't penetrate through air, so not a good way to sample it. Good news is there's enough stuff going on in the thorax that you probably could sample that. But one of the things that I kind of go back down to is because I don't see it as a circle here, it makes me lean more towards this idea that these are probably airways that are just really, really thick. So now all of a sudden I start going down the path of, okay, what's wrong with him? And he doesn't really have a fever. He doesn't really have any signs that he's got, you know, maybe this is kind of some weird chronic airway disease, but doesn't make a lot of sense because it's so multifocal and you have these cysts. So the first thing I thought of was parasitism. Right? So whether or not it's Paragonimus kilicati, which is something that could be down here where it's basically, you know, you can have these lung worms that create abscesses and cavitations inside the lung. Whether or not it's some sort of weird, like, ends, you know, you had heartworm disease in this cat, and now all of a sudden you have these thick airways from the inflammatory reaction. I put that a lot less on my differential, but I do still have all these little nodules going down here. But what's nice is if I really do think this is in the airway, bronchoscopy would actually be a really good step for this. Or also even just doing a CBC and seeing if the eosinophils are really high. Doing a tracheal wash. All these sort of things might help us out because I know that I can't aspirate this lung because there's nothing peripheral enough for me to aspirate. So where you might end up looking at a thoracic radiograph and being like, oh gosh, I, this is overwhelming, I don't know what to do with you know, the idea is you don't have to know exactly what the answer is, right? You just need to know what am I going to do about it next. And the first thing that you're going to realize from this is subcutaneous fluids and some antibiotics, probably not going to do it. And that's one of the things, because if it's not something you're used to seeing, that's where you start going down the path of going, okay, what are the things that's not? And the first thing, you know, it came in for, for oncology, right? Because they just thought it's got to be cancer. And could this be some sort of pulmonary bronchovelar carcinoma? Possibly, but it's not quite the classic appearance that I'd expect. And why does it seem to be centered around airways? So that's why you start kind of going down the path of saying, well, sure, it's possible, but what can we do to try to rule out all these other things? And so it's probably, and you can go through your, your damn it scheme if you want to, but the, the, the degenerative and all that sort of stuff, anomalous, uh, metabolic. But the idea is that for me, some sort of, if that's really a thick airway, some form of inflammatory disease, and by far the easiest thing that could be multifocal like that would be some sort of inflammatory action secondary to parasitism. So it would be interesting to see. They said they promised, this was like today or yesterday, so they promised they'd keep me posted. But I wanted you to kind of see that so you could kind of hear the thought process behind it, right? Because a lot of people will show you something and be like, oh yeah, this is a classic bronchial lung pattern with mild bronchiectasis. And, and I think this is, and this turns out to be parasitism. And you're like, oh yeah, so I could totally see that. Yeah, no idea what this is. <laughs> But I can tell you there are ways to figure it out, and these aren't the ones that you just go, okay, I, I don't know what to do. We probably just should put him on some steroids and, and see if he gets any better. Because that's where we start getting into these problems, because you give this cat steroids, and if this is parasitic, then you're just going to make him a lot worse, right? And so you always want to know what you're treating, especially when we start coming down to some of these cases. Because if you might have lymphoma on your differential, remember, you get two weeks of prednisone. If they want to go back and say, oh, I want to do chemotherapy, well, after two weeks, they find that it's about 95% resistant to every chemotherapy drug known to man. So 
you know, you think you might be, oh yeah, he's feeling a lot better on prednisone, but trust me, coming from the realm of when we see transitional cell carcinoma, we're like, oh, we don't really want to stick a needle into his urinary bladder because it does run a tendency to seed. And so if you're going to treat him, we're just going to basically, we'll do some traumatic catheterization, we'll do something less invasive. Oh, no, no, we're not going to treat him if it turns out to be cancer. You get the diagnosis, cancer. I want to do everything. And you're like, great. So, you know, it happens, but just realize it doesn't mean that you have to be precluded from it. But the question comes down to is, do I think this is airway or do I think this is airspace? And the hard part is, it's both, right? I have this big mass back here, but the problem is this mass is not accessible to me. Like if this is accessible, boom, I'd have my idea. I'd ultrasound guide aspirate that. But because that's not accessible, my next thought is, well, I have an airway disease. And so what's the easiest way to figure out airways? Transtracheal or, or just, well, not trans anymore, but just tracheal wash. Or I'll do um, a bronchalveolar lavage. And then you can come up with some differentials to do it. And to be honest, one of the things I always do is I rarely... If I have other differentials besides cancer, I have a tendency to lean on that first because as soon as somebody hears cancer, they're like, oh my God, my uncle had cancer and I don't want to do it. I don't want to see that. And you're like, yeah, it's not kind of the same thing. Like we don't, we don't put animals in chemo so all their hair falls out. Um, so that's one of the things that's also about education as well. But like if I have a dog with osteosarcoma, for example, and he has a two millimeter nodule inside of his thorax, sure, that could be metastatic disease. But my first thing that I'll tell him is it's probably a granuloma. Why? Because whether or not he has a two millimeter nodule in his lung doesn't stop the fact that he has osteosarcoma of his, his humerus. And so if you're gonna treat the osteosarcoma, we can keep an eye on this nodule, and I'm sure it might get bigger, but it's not what's going to kill him. Like, you know, osteosarcoma is probably already met it, so that's not the key. But the, the, the idea is how strong do you want to be? Because I don't know. It could be either, right? If it's five, six millimeters, I'm going to lean more towards the idea of it being cancer. But if it's in that gray area, two to four millimeters, then that's what digitals really cause problems with because now we can see it, and we never could before. So we see a three-millimeter nodule, and we're like, I don't know, that might be something. Uh, if he was a person, they would start giving you CT scans. And that was where they started doing. They'd CT scan you every two months for a year and just see if it got bigger. And then if it didn't, then they'd do a CT scan on you every six months for another year and see if it got bigger. And, and the problem was after about nine CT scans, if you didn't have cancer, you probably are gonna. <laughs> so you kind of end up running into that problem. Self-perpetuating problem. So. So yeah, I'm not sure. I'll get back to you on what that is, but I just wanted you to kind of hear because sometimes we'll go through these cases and you'll be like, gosh, that's so smart. I should have known that. Very rarely am I going to show you a case that's very clear-cut pathognomonic. I knew exactly what this is. We'll talk about how we got to it because the problem is I didn't make up these histories. This is what I usually get. Lethargic and coughing. That's probably every thorax that pretty much comes through. Is is kind of kind of, and I was like, you know, especially when it's a feline, you're like, lethargic feline. How do you know? Like, he sleeps for 23 hours a day. Um, and I love the ones that the cat vomits once a month. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's pretty much definition of a cat. So. The problem is you have mild cough, right? And so what's the first thing we do? We say, okay, well, let's just treat him for a mild cough. We'll give him some, maybe some anti and uh, and supportive care. He doesn't have a fever, doesn't have anything. The problem is you're sitting on this. And you didn't know because a lot of times, especially with thoracic lesions, we've seen lungs riddled with mets on routine prophylactic dental thoracic radiographs. And you're like, how are you breathing? But the idea is for one, especially if it's a cat, like not athletic. So it's like, you know, he doesn't run to his food bowl as fast. And, and, and I always loved the dogs where, you know, you get this 15 year old dog that's just not running his six mile run in the morning as fast. And you're like, he's 15. I'm surprised he's running at all. So you kind of end up running into this problem that you guys, it's, it is very hard from a practitioner standpoint because you get it right at the beginning with such vague signs and you're like what do I do I could run every test known to man like we do in veterinary school like everything that walks through the door, C doors CBC cam UA abdominal ultrasound thoracic radiographs it's like we might as well just stamp it and say here here you go this is what we're gonna do but kind of going down that path of do I take thoracic radiographs do I take abdominal radiographs 
it should be relatively straightforward because you can divide those diseases and, and you're going to catch things like this. Now, I wanted to show you this mainly because it's vague, right? I have a soft tissue opacity that's occupying the entire cranial thorax. I see there's a heart in there somewhere. There's like this cardiac silhouette that at least I can make out the back portion of. And maybe I have this soft tissue opacity up here that maybe, hey, that could be left atrium, not quite sure. But when you kind of do the opposite view, one of the things that you'll notice is that you do have your, your lungs being pulled away from the body wall here. I've lost a lot of my, uh, my cardiac silhouette, but I can still see a little bit of it. And that's sometimes one of these things that people kind of, kind of lose sight of. They kind of go, well, because I can see a little bit of that cardiac silhouette, he can't have fluid inside of his thorax. Not really true, right? Because if I actually have fat in the pericardial space, you can create what we call a pericardial fat stripe sign, which at one point we had one that was really cool when I was a resident that looked like gas is pericardium. We were like, oh my God, how do you develop a spontaneous pneumopericardium? And what we realized was it was just that he had such a good fluid opacity. It was a cat and just really fat. He had a really good fluid opacity and you could see his cardiac silhouette and you could just see the fat that was around the heart that made it look like it was gas. So kind of think about, realize that if it's less opaque than soft tissue or fluid, you have two choices, not just one. It's either gas or it's fat. And how are you going to tell the difference? Well, you can try to figure out what makes sense. Like, does he have an emphyseminous pericarditis? Chances are no. But the other option is that you could actually realize that the hard part comes down to is you got some summation, so sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference. So again, lateral radiographs are great. I can see that, but I still can't really localize where this lesion is, right? I can't tell. Maybe at least I kind of say, well, it's probably not in the right cranial lung lobe because I think I can see the right cranial lung lobe. But it could just as easily be in my left cranial, though I kind of have retraction of lung lobes here, and I can see these nice little pleural fissure lines coming through, so at least I know there is some fluid. But that's why it's always nice to take a ventral dorsal or dorsal ventral projection. In this case, you know, how you end up taking it is fine. It's, it's in, in our case, we kind of look at it and say, hey, if I want to take a dorsal ventral projection, you can end up seeing here that I can still make out the cardiac silhouette, but look how wide his cranium mediastinum is. And that's what's nice about that three view projections. A lot of people are just like, oh, I'll just take the lateral. But having both laterals will allow me to see, yeah, okay, these lungs are being pushed further back. I can see here that I'm um, dealing with kind of these, these, uh, these blood vessels coming all the way out to the periphery. So I can see that, yeah, I'm taking a dorsal ventral. But what's nice is also if I can make out the pericardial space, then maybe there's not as much fluid as I thought there was. There probably still is some fluid, but at least I'm not losing my cardiac silhouette as much as I would if there was a large amount of fluid, right? Because there's still at least some lung that's accentuating the cardiac silhouette so I can see it. So one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this was basically the hard part is sometimes people might think that this is just a really big heart. You know, you kind of see it that's growing out and just pushing everything out of the way, especially on this lateral. And, and when you start looking at the ventral dorsal, sure, he's got some left atrial enlargement because you can see some, some bowing of his principal bronchi and things. But one of the nice parts is that your carina is always stuck to the cardiac silhouette. So wherever this carina is, you can know that the heart is right over top. And so it would be very weird to have kind of a, a, a figure eight heart. And so that's one of the things that makes you realize, yeah, the only thing that's really stuck to a heart like this is a thymus. So you're probably dealing with some sort of thymoma, thymic lymphoma. And then when we started looking at the thorax, one of the other things is I have a really bad interstitial lung pattern in the caudal dorsal lung field. And again, if you're not sure about interstitial, alveolar, or bronchular, the idea comes down to is, well, probably if we go all the way back to this cat, I mean, kind of best case of bronchular ever. You got these huge thick bronchi, but you can kind of see these donuts in here. But the way I end up thinking about bronchular is I still have lung beneath it, right? I can still see the black underneath. Whereas when I think about interstitial lung patterns, one of the things that I'll start seeing is that I don't make out the blood vessels as well. And it's just kind of fuzzy. Like if I look at it, it could get whiter. Like it's not completely filled, like I would say it was alveolar, and so it's kind of halfway between a bronco and alveolar lung pattern. And that's why it's not that helpful when you start thinking about interstitial. Because when you think about where this whole thing came from, it came back from the 60s, right? So what they did was they took all these dogs, right before they euthanized them, they took some radiographs. They took some radiographs, they euthanized them, they cut them open, and they did histopath on their lungs. And so they take these dogs, 
cut them open, they see that they had really thick airways, they say, hey, this guy had asthma, he had bronchial, we call this a bronchial pattern on histo, they look at the radiograph and say, okay, this is going to be a bronchial pattern on radiographs. Same thing with interstitial, there were all these dogs with canine distemper, cut them open, had these type 2 pneumocytes, they said, okay, this is what we would call an interstitial pneumonia, so we called it an interstitial lung pattern. And then alveolar, same way, cut them open, they had aspiration pneumonia, they had full alveoli of fluid, Histologically, they said it was alveolar. We can't tell histopath on radiographs. And the problem is, back in the 60s, it was great because it was like three differentials. Now we have more, and so we're kind of realizing that bronco interstitial alveolar don't really help us that much when it comes down to figuring out what the diagnosis is. And a lot, you know, there's, there's papers, there was one paper that came out by my resident mate and compendium that basically said bronco interstitial alveolar is a lot like saying mild, moderate, and severe. And so if you kind of think of bronchial as being a mild case of disease, because you could have uh, you know, a bronchial lung pattern progress to interstitial that then progresses to alveolar. So you can kind of think of it that way if you want to as well. And that's why I kind of tend not to use alveolar unless I don't think it could get any worse. Because once you kind of hit severe, it's not like you kind of like more severe. And uh, that's why we also try to avoid the whole bronchointerstitial lung pattern because that's like saying it's mild to moderate and you're kind of making me choose. Like, which do you think is worse? Do you think it's bronchular or do you think it's interstitial? And does it really matter to you? Like, what do you think the disease process is? So one of the things that we tend to do, or that I tend to do, is I actually divide the lung into kind of two different spaces right at the carina. If I draw a straight line down, I'll actually say anything that happens to be in the craniovental. So right cranial right middle, left cranial lung lobes is going to be a craniovental uh, lung pattern. Anything caudal dorsal, is, so it's going to be right caudal, left caudal, and accessory lung lobes, it's going to be a caudal dorsal lung pattern. And by dividing it into those two, now all of a sudden I've kind of been able to separate my differentials. So if I say, okay, it's craniovental, then I have three differentials that I'll deal with. I'll either deal with uh, pneumonia, which is probably the most common. Most people will say aspiration pneumonia, but really it's bronchopneumonia that could be subcategorized. It could be hemorrhage. It could be cancer. Those are kind of the top three things that will happen craniovently. Caudal dorsally, I only have two differentials, cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So cardiogenic, very easy heart failure, left-sided heart failure. Non-cardiogenic, harder because it's like everything under the sun. Near drowning, ARDS, SIRS, barotrauma, electrocution, all these sort of things. But by making that determination, you're kind of going from your three differentials, like we talked about before, where it was cancer, heart failure, and pneumonia, you kind of go to five. So you kind of get a little bit more uh, kind of diversity to your, your pattern. Unless it's something like this where it's kind of diffuse and you're kind of like, oh, this is probably less about the lungs and more about the thorax. And in this case, this turned out it was thymic lymphoma and he actually had lymphoma in his lungs as well. Some of that was atelectasis. But the nice part is when we treated the thymic lymphoma by removing and chemotherapy, the lungs got better. And so we could use the lungs as kind of a guide to see how things worked and, and how things responded. But we didn't know what this was, but at least we knew it was solid enough and we had let all this lung retraction that we could use ultrasound and get a sample of the, the mass. And then we actually did a CT scan so we could do surgical planning. So we do, do more than just take thoracic radiographs. Rarely is thoracic radiographs the end. Usually that's the very beginning. And then we start going down the path of how are we going to further characterize that lesion. Adult canine, mild cough for four months, resolved with antibiotics, or cured when antibiotics were discontinued. I know I, I'm really bad about grabbing these rare cases that nobody's ever seen before. But one of the hard parts that you guys run into is that repeat customer, right? You give him antibiotics, he goes away, you're like, hey, he comes back, you're like, dang it. So, so you kind of try to figure out what's going on. And so what we did was we actually said, okay, well, and this is very common, and then they took radiographs. Like they, they did the, the antibiotics for a while, and then they realized it wasn't really getting back, and so it came back, so then they decided to take a thoracic radiograph. You take this right lateral radiograph, maybe you look at it and you're like, eh, I've seen worse. <laughs> but hopefully one thing that steps, steps out to you is, what's that trachea doing? It's kind of weird. It's kind of got this weird kind of curve to it. And tracheas do curve mainly because of head position, right? So if you tilt the head or you push it up, the hard part about the trachea is it, it's a finite distance, right? So it actually has to deal with the fact that your head can go in lots of different positions. Birds are amazing. Like if you ever get a goose, I mean, he's got a trachea. But it, I guess the idea is that they don't want them to be flying and stick their neck out and like evolve their trachea and be like, oh. So, <laughs> so when you bend in things, you can get this trachea to curve. But generally, the trachea is going to curve here. 
right near the thoracic inlet and a lot of times I get where this there's like a bump in the trachea and people are like oh my gosh it's got a cranium mediastinal mass and my first question is where like you can see the cranium mediastinum and if you think you have a mass the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to get as opaque as this heart right because it's going to have a soft tissue opacity the reason we don't see the cranium mediastinum very much is because you have a ton of lung and a very thin amount of fat with one or two vessels well two vessels going through you have the cranial vena cava and then you have your brachiocephalic trunk going through there but you don't really see it because it kind of blends out with everything else unless you have gas in that mediastinal space. But in this case, we actually have the trachea kind of coming up here and diving down here. So that kind of makes me think there got to be something next to the heart because as we talked about, this carina is always stuck to the top of the heart. The heart looks like it ends right about here, so what's pushing it up? And there's only really one thing. Well, I guess technically two. You can get a heart-based tumor right here. but biggest thing I always worry about when I have this sort of curve is I worry about tracheobronchial lymph nodes. And so I say, okay, but this is why right lateral radiographs are hard because if I actually just took a right lateral radiograph and then take the ventral dorsal radiograph, we start running into this problem, right? Because as a radiologist, you send this to me and I'll say, gosh, okay, I'm worried about a cranium, I'm worried about tracheobronchial lymph node. I'm not sure I can see it through the cardiac silhouette and through everything that I have right here. Maybe there's something there, but I can't even see the trachea very well. The heart looks okay. I have this kind of ill-defined soft tissue opacity here, but it's hard for me to see. And that's why it's so important for us to talk about taking two views, or three views, because you took a right lateral radiograph, which meant that this side was down, which meant that the heart collapsed it. And the only reason why we ever see any pulmonary nodule, or anything for that matter, is because there's two different opacities. If I have a soft tissue opacity sitting inside of a soft tissue atelectic lung, I'm not going to see it. But if I have a soft tissue opacity surrounded by air, I'm actually going to be able to see that. So taking the left lateral radiograph, getting that aerated, now all of a sudden I can see this really large pulmonary mass very easily. It's not something that we have to question or guess about. And so now we can start going, okay, yes, I am much more worried about the fact that he has a pulmonary mass. And then because his trachea is elevated, it makes sense that he's got a tracheobronchial lymph node. A couple things I'll tell you. The first thing is you will never get a tracheobronchial lymph node that you will see on a radiograph with pneumonia. So if you have an aspiration pneumonia, a really bad bronchopneumonia, lymph nodes might get to be up to a centimeter in size. There's no way you're going to see a centimeter on this thrust. We'll see it on CT, sure, but you're not going to be able to see it on a radiograph until it gets to be two, three centimeters in size. And the only time that happens is with cancer or fungal disease. So when I start seeing this, then I start going, okay, he's either got cancer or fungal disease. And because he has a solitary soft tissue opacity here, which is actually aspiratable because it was right against the skin so we could ultrasound it, we stuck a needle in it, this turned out this was malignant histiocytosis. And so one of the things that we will see a lot of times is in the right middle lung lobe, we'll see these solitary masses, primarily in Bernese mountain dogs, but we'll see it in golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers and some larger breed dogs as well. And the problem is they just present for this mild cough that doesn't resolve with antibiotics. Like you kind of, they kind of get a little bit better mainly with antibiotics just because of the anti-inflammatory effects and all that sort of good stuff because the irritant goes down. But you're not really treating the cause. You're just treating a symptom. And so that's where we start trying to go down the path of what are we trying to treat with veterinary medicine at this point. And the problem is we're usually tracing symptoms, right? We're always trying to, because, I mean, you know, the owner doesn't really care that he has cancer at this point, just doesn't want him to cough anymore because keeping him up at night. And you're trying to figure out, okay, well, how can I help that? But what's nice is now we can say, okay, yeah, I can see this. Now, granted, the hard part comes down to is a lot of times when we have this, it's usually in the abdomen as well. So doing abdominal ultrasound is helpful because it could be in the spleen, it can also be in the liver. It, that's why it's kind of called malignant histiocytosis because it could be anywhere. And sometimes we'll do CT scans, but it is resectable and then they can treat it with chemotherapy, but then the question is how efficacious it is. But again, now you don't have to manage it. Now you can, you can refer it, and if the owner's like, no, I trust you, just realize that you can always call and talk to an oncologist and figure out what the best next steps are. Most of the time, when you have a solid mass that can be removed, a lobectomy is the nicest way because you remove the problem and then you can treat them with chemotherapy to get the micrometastasis and kind of move on from there. But that's why we like to stage them first with, with ultrasound in the abdomen, just to make sure there's not abdominal components as well. Because if he's riddled in the abdomen too, maybe we're just going to gear a palliation. But what's nice is also, you give that owner the ability to start having some closure. right? Because instead of them presenting on death's door and you're like, oh, we're going to have to euthanize them, 
Now we still have weeks, months that we can kind of manage him and keep him comfortable, but at least they know what's happening. And that's why a lot of people are like, oh, he's got a mass in his lung. I don't need to get an aspirin. I'm pretty sure it's cancer. You know, it's true, but it's nice to be more than pretty sure when it comes to cancer. So that's because could this be a granuloma? Absolutely. Could this be a foxtail that he inhaled and now all of a sudden he's just got this huge kind of mass of granuloma or maybe even an abscess? Possibly. Two completely different prognoses, right? So I think the hard part that we end up dealing with is a lot of times we kind of jump to conclusions to say, oh, then give you the either the worst case scenario or the glass is half full and it's going to be okay, but we don't kind of want to try to think about, okay, well, how am I going to make that determination? And one of the things I can tell you that has frustrated clients, especially with telemedicine more, is this idea that we're trying to give you those both options. And people think that we're not choosing, but it's mainly what we're trying to do is give you the options so that you know this doesn't have to be that bad, but it could be. And you need to do something for, uh, for us to make that determination. And, and, you know, I get that call all the time. Well, what do you think it's going to be? And that's when I start coming down to, to, to percentages. 70% chance it's going to be cancer. Because you know that 86% of the time that somebody asks for a percentage, it's going to be about 76. So <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of end up realizing that you can kind of gauge it towards how confident are you is much more of what a percentage for me is. Like if I think that 50-50, sure, that, that you could go either way, it's going to be a lot about the history. Like how long is a cough? How old is the dog? You know, if this is a two-year-old dog, I'd love for this to be an uh, inhaled foreign body. Though most inhaled foreign bodies should be caudal dorsal, not craniventral. So it's not really kind of fitting that, that idea. And I've had cancer after six months of age. That's pretty much my my cut point. If I have a seven month old puppy, he can have lymphoma. He can have cancer. So you have to be careful about jumping in conclusions and saying, oh, you know what, I'm just going to see how this goes. I'm going to treat this like an, uh, um, an abscess and see how we do. You can do that, but just make sure you're following up every four, uh, in about four weeks because it's probably going to progress if it's cancer. So that's kind of the reason why I like to say, you know, you could probably make this diagnosis with two views, but why do we even pick right lateral in the first place, right? When you think about it, right lateral radiographs, the only reason we took right laterals is because it makes the heart look the best for cardiac evaluations. Left lateral radiographs, a lot of times the heart actually looks a bit more rounded, and a lot of times it's elevated off the sternum. So we have a tendency not to take left lateral radiographs, plus most people's X-ray suites are lined up so that when you throw the dog down, it just happens to be on right ladder, right? It's just, just how we do it. Um, but the problem is right middle lung lobe is one of the biggest lung lobes that get aspiration pneumonia. So most of the time, you're going to miss it. So that's why people said, well, let's take a ventral dorsal projection because that's going to aerate the ventral aspect to lung, so I'm going to get the best chance to see an aspiration pneumonia as long as it's not sitting over top of the heart. And the cardiac silhouette is going to obscure that. So if you ever wondered where the right lateral and VD came from, that's kind of it. But if you think you have heart failure, I can tell you that if you can only take two views, you should take a right lateral and a dorsoventral projection, since most of our heart failure is going to happen in the ca right caudal lung lobe. But we can't see that right caudal lung lobe very well when they're on their back because the diaphragm compresses it. Whereas if I think that I have aspiration pneumonia, it's actually much better for you to take a left lateral radiograph and a ventral dorsal projection because you're going to err air on the side being able to see that right middle lung lobe and you're going to be able to see the cranioventral lung, which is where all that aspiration pneumonia happens to be. That's why we kind of said, you know what, three views, so much easier. And what I usually tell my techs to try to give techs the empowered to make this determination as well is we generally will take both lateral radiographs. And I'd say, if you see something in the cranioventral lung field, then I want you to take a VD. If you see something up here in the caudal dorsal, take a DV. And if you're not sure, take both. Uh, Purdue actually does four view radiographs for everything. Doesn't really help to have the fourth view because most of the time you're making your diagnosis on both laterals. But what happens with that DV and VD is it just helps us triangulate it a lot better. So just something to kind of bear in mind. 15 year old domestic short haired cat. Lethargy, intermittent cough, questionable heart murmur. Because you know really when it's at a 200 beats per minute and somebody says yes I think there's a grade 3 heart murmur I just kind of go yeah right. I'm like how are you going to tell unless you palpate a thrill or something. This is what we had. Right lateral left lateral, and ventral dorsal. So we'll go back to the right lateral for a second. I know, but see, that's all the time you really needed. When you look at that, 
Craniventral or caudal-dorsal? Craniventral. <laughs> if I draw a straight line coming down here, then I think it is much more craniventral than it's going to be caudal dorsal. The problem that I run into with that, okay, craniventral to me, eh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I still see some in the caudal dorsal. Absolutely, you're always going to see both, right? It's just like if I had to pick a pattern, I can see some bronchi in here, but I'd probably lean on interstitial as my pattern of choice because it's not bright enough to be alveolar, but I can't see lung behind it, so that's why I kind of just jump to interstitial. How does that help me? Absolutely not, but it's just nice to have a name that you can say it. If you want to say he has moderate lung pattern, that's fine too. If you wanted to say, I think he's got a pattern inside of his air space, that would work because I think it's parenchymal, right? I don't think this is airway just because I don't have any lung behind it. So all those sort of things can might help you out a little bit, but what's going to really kind of, kind of just make you mad is that, you know, cats just don't always follow the rules. And this actually responded very well to Lasix. And so this was actually atypical heart failure. So he has a, uh, a big heart, a big cardiac silhouette. His vessels are a little bit on the larger side as well. What I'll also tell you is if you have an animal that presents to you that has been treated for heart failure and it comes in with a craniventral lung pattern, the biggest problem you run into is one of the easiest causes for, for bronchopneumonia is heart failure because you get fluid in the lungs that sets up for a bacterial infection. So you could absolutely, this could be an inflammatory cause. This could be a bronchopneumonia. It could also be heart failure. How am I going to tell the difference? We gave him Lasix. And in two hours, we retook the radiographs, and this was all much better. It doesn't have to go away. And, and our cardiologist was like, well, it could, it could take 24 hours to resolve. Absolutely. But it should be better. Like it, it should actually improve. It doesn't have to be completely better, but the animal should feel better and this should be better because the whole point about heart failure, remember, is that the heart has a finite amount of, of fluid in our bodies, right? It's not all of a sudden we're going to start weeping fluid, though that would be weird. Um, but you're kind, of, you're kind of going by your day, your heart starts failing, and so you have excess fluid inside of your heart that it's trying to push into the rest of your body, it can't. So what it does is it starts going, okay, all you, all you organs, can you just take a little bit more? Liver, can you get a little bit bigger? Sure. Everybody starts getting bigger, the caudal vena cava gets bigger, and then they start going, okay, we're not keeping up. So what happens, we get pitting edema in our legs, it starts third spacing some fluid, right? Well. When you're kind of dealing with left-sided heart failure, now all of a sudden the right side's kind of kind of still pumping the blood through. It's like, dude, I'm doing fine because let's face it, I only have to go from heart to lung. How hard is this? The left side's like, oh, I got to do the whole body. I'm tired. So what happens first before you get all that back up is that all this blood comes into the lung and, and the, the heart's like, dude, can you take a little for me? So the, the lung basically just starts taking all that fluid and puts it into the, the third space, right? It just puts it into the interstitium. So why is that important? Lasix, being a loop diuretic, the first thing it's going to do, it just decreases cardiac preload because you're peeing it all out. So it takes all your excess fluid, puts it into your urinary bladder. So now all of a sudden, the heart has less work because it has less blood coming into it. So now the lung can basically go, oh, I want to give this back to you. And so it just puts that, that fluid back in circulation because basically you're a bit dehydrated. And so that's why it should improve because it's actually in a space that can take it. The problem with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is most of that is actually in the interstitium itself. It's inside of a cell, and so it can't come out. So you can dehydrate yourself as much as you want. The, the cell is like, dude, I'm good. I got this fluid. We're not going to give it up because it's inflammatory and it's causing all this reaction. And that's why Lasix won't help. You can dehydrate him, but now he's dehydrated and he can't breathe. So it's kind of sad. But when you have a big heart, and hearts are hard in cats, I agree, especially when you have this stuff. But if you think it's heart failure, the reason why I want to put this on here is if you think it could be heart failure, and you're debating heart failure versus pneumonia, you have choices. Does he have a fever? What's his CBC look like? Or let's give him a little bit of Lasix, because let's face it, if he's normally hydrated, Lasix isn't going to hurt anything. So you can give him some Lasix as what we call a Lasix trial, retake the radiograph, see if he's getting better. And if he's not, lean on the fact that it's probably going to be inflammation and it's probably going to be bronchopneumonia and not heart failure. But what I wanted to show you this is because I don't want you in this pattern that it has to be. Heart failure is always caudal dorsal, especially in cats. It's, I mean, this could be lymphoma for all we know, right? The hard part is we don't, but he has a heart murmur. And so the easiest first step isn't to take a lung biopsy. It's to give him a little Lasix and see how it does.
all we really have at the end of the day is a cranioventerial interstitial lung pattern. And so now we have to try to figure out, how am I going to figure this out? Is it a tracheal wash? Sure, that might help. But doing a tracheal wash in an animal that could be in heart failure, not so nice. So, so you can kind of go down that path too. Ten-year-old domestic short hair cat. We decided to go with the cat thing. So regurgitation for the past 24 hours, possible vomiting as well. You know, they can never tell. And uh, strange coughing noises, most of them, like they're just trying to cough up a hairball or something. You know, you've got that weird honk they were kind of describing, and, and you're like, huh, that seems weird. So they decided to take thoracic radiographs because of this weird coughing thing, too. And this is what we found. First thing we notice is that the heart, the cardiac silhouette seems to be pushed down, right? And the trachea seems to be pushed down by something that's a soft tissue opacity. You might even say it has a granular appearance to it. Um, can't really say it's got a granular opacity because, again, that puts a six opacity and Rankin gets upset and we get a phone call. Um, <laughs> so he rolls over in his grave. But the idea is that uh, we do have this granular material that seems to be dorsal to the trachea. Now, the question comes down to is, could this be in the esophagus? It could be, but the only way I'm going to triangulate that is by taking my ventral dorsal. And look, he does seem to have a very wide cranium mediastinum. So it would fit that this could be all in the esophagus. He's got a hugely distended stomach as well, right? And that's something that you can kind of end up taking in the fact that a lot of times they're going to be very aerophagic, and so they're going to swallow a lot of air. Most cats do this uh, when they're stressed out. And I thought this was kind of the coolest picture because a lot of times people always talk about contrast medium and they always want to give barium, right? But just realize that negative contrast medium is really cool too in the fact that you get a lot of gas in their stomach and you can actually even see he's got this dangly thing kind of hanging into his stomach coming right here. This actually turned out to be a huge hairball that he had when they scoped him, they pulled it all out. And, uh, and he also had a hairball kind of in his pylorus as well. Uh, but the idea is that that esophagus, the first thing people always want to think, he's vomiting, let's give him some barium. You could absolutely give this, this cat some barium liquid, three to four milliliters of barium liquid, even if he aspirates it a little bit, it's just barium, it's, inner, it's inert, shouldn't really cause too much of a problem, just looks unsightly. Uh, 60 cc's of barium, probably going to give you a little bit of a problem, but three or four cc's going to be okay. Uh, as an aside, one of the fun things, one of the fun facts is if you ever wonder where the term air bronchogram came from, well, back in the 70s, they thought, you know, I can't see airways very well, and this guy's coughing. So they actually would take barium and squirt it down the trachea so that it would coat the airway and create these bronchograms. And, uh, and so they said, hey, you know, okay, so we could see if they had pneumonia. And the good news is if he didn't have pneumonia, he would within three to four <laughs> days. So it all just helped everything out. Then, all of a sudden, when they got the pneumonia three days later, they started realizing there was an air bronchogram, and they were like, oh, look at that, it's like opposite. So, so that's where that term came from. But in this case, you know, the idea is that a lot of times we can kind of make the diagnosis if we have contrast. And one of the things that helps is having contrast, it's having gas distending through it. But realizing that just on the lateral radiograph, having this distension, nothing really should be able to displace the heart, the cardiac silhouette, and the trachea ventrally, except for something that's in the mediastinal space. Like if I had a pulmonary mass, it could shift the heart basically one way or another, but it really shouldn't push it down. Just like I really shouldn't get anything that can push the cardiac silhouette directly caudally except for a cranium mediastinal mass because it has to be in the same space. Otherwise, it's going to push it to the left or the right. But because the pericardium and the, cardi and the heart sit inside of the mediastinal space, the really the mediastinal space is the only thing that can actually have a direct influence on it. So that's kind of what he end, ends up coming down to. And I just thought it was really nice with the gas that you could actually see the, uh, the, the dangling piece of hair that was coming. But this could just as easily be a piece of cloth. We've seen roast beef. I had this really good one where this was chihuahua that swallowed and it had this big soft tissue pasty and a tooth inside of it and we're like oh my gosh this is like a teratoma because we were like <laughs> wanted to be cool about it right you're like oh it's got to be some really cool tumor turned out had some roast beef and really bad dental disease <laughs> so so as he ate it one of the teeth got stuck in the roast beef as he swallowed it and it got stuck in his esophagus not as cool as a teratoma but still uh, able to be diagnosed so I think a lot of people worry that they're going to miss esophageal foreign bodies and you really don't 
because you're going to be able to see either gas distension cranially or you're going to be able to see um, some sort of change as you go through the esophagus itself. And if you're not sure, again, small volumes of barium. And you know, a lot of times we'll just give three cc's in a syringe and just squirt it in the side of their mouth because it's going to stick to anything that happens to be in the esophagus. And people are like, oh, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do a large volume, but it's okay to give them a little bit because you're not going to use fluoroscopy to see it. And if it coats it, the biggest thing I'll tell you is that it's just going to tick off the internal medicine specialist that has to scope it because it makes a mess of the scope. So if you think that you're going to scope it anyway, don't give them barium. But if you're kind of trying to figure out what's going on, then barium is a nice way to kind of stick things to be able to see if it's really inside the lumen of the esophagus. But, or just make sure they have aerophasia. It's always helpful too. Three-month-old golden retriever, you know, happy-go-lucky, really excited, except for the fact that the owner said all of a sudden he just started panting really bad and just, just seems like he cannot breathe. And you kind of look at his gums, and they're kind of bluish. This is the latter radiograph that we take. When we rush him out of oxygen, take some radiographs and put him back in. You see this. And this was probably about 24 hours after the, the, the onset of clinical signs, right lateral. Ventrodorsal. So, you got a caudal dorsal. Now, I have no problem calling this alveolar, right? Because, you know, you kind of have some air bronchograms, so you can see the airway coming in. But I don't think that lung can get much worse. Some people will call it perihylar. You got the uh, caudal dorsal lung pattern right here. And, uh, and so now, we kind of have to decide. You know, no heart murmur or anything like that. So you have a choice. This is going to be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. How are you going to tell? Well, the first step is you can actually look at, you don't see any distension of, of pulmonary vessels, acute onset of signs, no heart disease. So you kind of end up leaning down the path of this is probably not going to be cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But, you know, if you really feel like you want to give him Lasix, you could as long as he's normally hydrated. I can tell you it didn't change at all. And one of the interesting things is I can also tell you that we took radiographs of this uh, 24 hours before and this wasn't even there. Like he had acute onset of, of respiratory distress and very normal thoracic radiographs. And it wasn't until 24 hours later he was getting a little bit worse. We took radiographs and now all of a sudden we have this. So it took time for it to develop. So that was one of the other things that were kind of like, yeah, that's interesting. And this actually turns out, this if you looked at him really closely, he had a really nice burn mark across his tongue. And this is actually an electrocution. But we've seen the exact same from a dog that fell off a grooming table and hung from a grooming table. Or a dog that jumped over the railing of his fence and was hanging from the fence. Because this could be barotrauma as well. Barotrauma generally happens when you're being choked and they're trying to breathe. So because they can't actually inhale, their diaphragm pulls back and that negative pressure actually causes fluid to third space just because of the edema that happens with barotrauma. Drowning can do this as well. They usually call it dry drowning rather than wet drowning. Um, and actually there was this news article on the um, uh, that was a couple of days ago where this child actually dry drowned three days after he went into a pool uh, and kind of choked and, and kind of drowned a little bit but he was fine and then all of a sudden three days later he developed pulmonary edema and died and so the idea is that with that it's the same thing as barotrauma what happens is when you get into the water your epiglottis closes and your, your, your trachea will shut down so you're constantly trying to breathe because you know that there's fluid on the other side. Your body won't let you breathe and so you develop pulmonary edema from the barotrauma of just like being choked. So it's kind of the same basic principle. Whereas if you actually liquid drown, generally it'll be craniventral. It wouldn't be caudal dorsal. It could be, but unless you kind of aspirate standing up like we would have caudal dorsal aspiration but dogs because they're on all fours generally be a craniventral pattern if they're drowning suspect so so that's one of the things that you kind of come down to is especially when you start looking at the the radiographs and you realize if anything his heart his cardiac silhouette seems small you kind of go well this doesn't quite fit and these are the ones that you don't want to waste a lot of time using lasix now granted the biggest thing you end up doing this is supportive care. You can give, you can try to give some anti-inflammatories, but most of the time what we do is we put them on antibiotics because this is going to actually predispose them to having pneumonia, 
And so they can actually get a secondary hematogenous spread pneumonia just because this is a great blood auger medium, right? I mean, it's a really good place for bacteria to be. And let's face it, our airway is very dirty, so it's very easy to set up for a bacterial infection. So that's one of the things that you can kind of do, but most of the time what's going to happen is it's going to be like three to five days in the oxygen cage for him to get better. And he hopefully will get better, but sometimes it kind of con continues to cascade, and it's very hard to treat, So because it all depends on how bad he was electrocuted. I can't thank you enough for coming. I can't thank NVS for having me uh, enough. It's always great to come back. And so if there's anything you need, please let me know. But thank you so much for your time.